Hi everybody, welcome to another video. Today I would like to talk about capacitances because people, mainly in the power electronics region, they love RLC models. They love describing the behavior of the structures using RLC models. They are easy to read and people tend to use them a lot on the schematic. However, I would like to show you today that you can easily get tricked by capacitance values or you should understand capacitance in detail before comparing results and also before um, understanding how to use the extracted SPICE files typically, how to use them on the schematic to get what you are actually looking for. Because, I mean, capacitance is a simple concept. You typically, you might even learn it in high school, right? Everybody thinks about a parallel plate capacitor. There is a capacitance between the two plates. The higher the capacitance, the more energy is stored in the capacitor. All that kind of things are pretty simple to understand. However, there is one thing when capacitance becomes complicated, and you can read it on Wikipedia. So if you check Wikipedia, capacitance, there is one sentence which will cause a lot of trouble to us. You see, the discussion above is limited to the case of two conducting plates, also of arbitrary size and shape. The definition C equals Q over V does not apply when there are more than two charged plates or when the net charge on the two plates is non-zero. And that's something which typically will happen in any realistic setup. So I took a, a half bridge, basically a half bridge module setup like you'll find in power electronics. Um, it's a very simple geometry. We don't need to have a, a, a highly elaborated geometry. We talk about the capacitance. So what we have here is, uh, I mean, that's the plus, that's the minus input, that's the AC output, and there's a cooling plate. So basically what we have are four four conductive bodies, right? So here on the on the high side, you would be able to mount three transistors in parallel. And on the low side, you might also mount three transistors in parallel, while here the AC output. And now the task is calculate the capacitance between the, uh, between the N input and between the P input. What's the capacitance in between them? And now, of course, in a simulation, we have access to, to a number of different solvers. And I think it's important to understand how the solvers behave. So let's start with something most obvious. It's a full wave solver, right? Frequency domain method, finite element, full wave solver. So what we need to do to calculate the capacitance, we need to place a port. A place a port between the N and between the P. And once it simulates, it's calculating S parameters. And from the S parameters, we can calculate the capacitance by using simple formulas. Again, Wikipedia, if you go to the Smith chart section, it says the capacitance can be calculated from the, uh, from the Z parameters, from the impedance matrix, or from the admittance matrix, right? That's exactly what the post processing in CSD Studio is doing. So I define in the post processing tab, I defined a result template. I defined one calculating C11. We have only one port. We calculate C11, which is the capacitance between the two plates, because the port has been placed between the two plates. And I calculate them over Y and over Z parameters, okay? This gives me some results and it gives me a particular capacitance. Let's read the value. It's something like 1.19 E minus 11. Capacitance, because the material properties don't vary, it's just metal capacitance is, is constant from basically DC up to 100 megahertz. That's what the full wave solver calculates. And what's the assumption here? Of course, the full wave solver does not know anything about grounding. So it puts the source in here, calculates S parameters, calculates Y parameters or Z parameters, and we get the capacitance. If we want to reproduce the setup now in the so-called E-static solver, so that's a low frequency approach, we can go to the so-called E-static solver. So that's the same setup in the E-static solver. And in the E-static solver, what I do, I define two potential. I define one potential on, on, on the minus and one potential on the plus. And we can calculate the capacitance matrix. And now it comes down to the first thing, as we have seen on Wikipedia, what do we do with the two metal plates which do not carry, or two, two conductors which do not carry any source definition, the AC 
and the cooling plate. It currently does not carry any source definition. And there is an option actually in the specials of the eStatic solver to tell you what it's doing. So it says PECs, bodies, metallic bodies without a source. How to treat them? Should they be grounded or should they be floating? And this makes a difference actually because if we think about the full wave solver, it cannot ground anything. A ground does not exist. So obviously, if we want to compare to the full wave solver, we have to take the setup where everything else is floating, because that's exactly the setup that is done in the full wave. And when we go and read the capacitance matrix, you see it's 1.19 E minus 11, which is basically the same value that we have read here, 1.19 E minus 11. So we get a very nice, a, a perfect agreement between the E static solver and the full wave solver. But we had to understand how the setups look like. And now one thing comes, pops up here. There are two definitions of the capacitance matrix. I, I, I went quickly over it and I read the value which was defined between potential one and potential two. That's the two bodies where we defined the where we defined the sources. And it gives me this, this value. But the capacitance matrix also creates, let's say, a, a calculation between potential one and potential one, which typically is interpreted as the so-called self-capacitance. And what's the reason behind saying there's a grounded and a lumped matrix? It's something which is a little bit difficult to understand and I also I have my difficulties to explain it. The main difference is because the capacitance matrix is used to calculate the charges, right? So Q equals C times the voltage. And if you have a multiple body system um, or multiple conductive bodies and something which is called ground. Now, this is something you don't have in the full wave section. Uh, these two descriptions of the capacitance matrix uh, just the they describe the same system. They just differ in the way you define actually the voltages. So in the so-called grounded capacitance matrix, the voltages you define are always the voltages between the conductor and the ground. And now it says if the ground conductor has a potential of zero volt, then the voltage is equal to the potential. Now it becomes a little bit complicated, right? You can, the voltage needs to be defined always between two bodies while the potential is defined as the, as, as the voltage to ground. And so in the grounded capacitance matrix, all of you, all of you source definitions basically are always referenced to ground. While in the lumped capacitance matrix, you can also define a voltage between this conductor. So you can see U2 is a voltage from conductor 2 to ground, while U12 is the voltage between conductor 1 and conductor 2. It's a little bit confusing to many people, but also if we talk about um, calculating the capacitance between two bodies, we don't need to care too much about this because you see in the grounded matrix, you get between potential one and potential two, this value minus 1.19, while in the lumped, you get the same value just with a changed sign, just the main diagonal elements differ. And if you use these equations here, you can get always to the right, right, to the right system. So that's, that's not a big issue. It's just sometimes, you know, sometimes people compare to other outputs or compare to analytic formulas. And you have to know to what you are comparing. Did the other tool calculate the grounded or the lumped capacitance matrix? And this is why we, we print out both. For the further comparisons, it doesn't matter that much. We look at uh, 1, 2 and the absolute value of 1, 2 will be always the same. We don't look at 1, 1 right now. So this was the setup with everything floating, which compares very well to the full wave. But that's maybe not necessarily the setup looking for. And that's why the e-static solver now, if we go back first here, I close the field plot. Um, it allows me to do this another special setting, right? It allows me to set all pack without sources are grounded, no longer floating. And if we use this setup, basically the values will change. So the capacitance between body one and body two, between the N and the P, has a different value in the setup. Why is this? Because the potential distribution 
that I used to calculate the capacitance value has changed. And we can visualize this potential distribution. So let's go back to the floating case and look at the potential here plotted. So you can see, okay, that's the potential, that's the sources I have defined. So I have defined minus one for the, uh, for the minus and plus one for the plus one. And you can see that the two other conductive bodies, the AC and the cooling plate, they have a, a, thick, a potential which is calculated from the setup. So they are not at zero potential. I can, they have also a different potential. Let me move this a little bit. So you can see here the AC, um, the AC arm or the AC conductor has a potential of something like 0.22, you can read at the bottom, and this one has 0.26. So there's a different potential distribution. That that's, that's exactly the setup of the full wave solver. It's, it's floating. That means that there will be a, a certain potential. Of course, a full wave solver is not working with potentials, but the electrostatic does. And if we do the second setup where all the other conductors are grounded and we look at the potential, that's exactly what we would expect, right? These conductors are grounded, so that means they are at zero potential. And that means that the capacitance you get from the one or the other setup will differ. And now you have to un know what's the capacitance lo looking for. I cannot tell you, the software cannot tell you, you have to understand what is your setup. So be aware that the way you treat the other conductors inside the computation domain will affect the capacitance of, of the two conductors which you define sources on top of it. So that's an important, very important finding. And now you have to know what is the one you are looking for. How will the other, uh, how will the other metallic bodies behave actually? What capacitance are you looking for? That's the question you have to ask yourself before running the simulation. What's the setup you are looking for? And now we had the, I mean, we had the full wave solver, we had the e-static solver, and now of course people love to use the so-called partial RLC solver. So the partial RLC solver now, it exports a SPICE file. And um, it, the setup is a little bit more complex because now I set up in the partial RLC solver, I set up so-called nodes. And these nodes will be placed typically there where I would like to connect my transistors, right? So I set a number of RLC nodes, one at the cooling plate, which is the huge green one, then at the inputs, here are my RLC nodes, and then at the transistor side. So I have three transistors, so a high side drain, high side drain, high side drain, and on the bottom high side source, 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 and the same on the low side, so I have the drain at the AC part and the low side source up here. So in the end, I, I end up with a number of, of, of nodes, a number of sources. And now this is another, let's say, layer of complexity. You remember we had four conductive bodies. Each conductive body in the e-static solver had a source. What I do now is, of course, in the partial RLC solver, if I want to have these nodes, I am adding multiple sources onto the same body, right? So if we look at the plus, so plus and high side one, high side two, high side three drain, these are four source definitions onto the same body. And now when I calculate the capacitance, of course, I have to bring it down to, uh, to just one, because the capacitance is defined between conductive body. The capacitance is not defined between separate sources. However, if I want to do a spice export, what I need to do, I had to take the capacitance, which is on, defined on the full body, and I have to distribute this capacitance on, this, on the separate nodes, because I want to export a spice, and the spice file that I export should give me the behavior, the physical behavior of the structure, right? And exactly this brings me to the definition of the partial capacitance. That's something which is, is difficult, or I don't know how to interpret it physically. What it does, it distributes the real capacitance on these nodes, and that's what's called partial capacitance. So the partial RLC solver now, it calculates both. You can see in the tree, it calculates capacitance. This is the capacitance between the conductive bodies, and it calculates partial capacitance. This is the capacitance which has been distributed on the different on the different nodes, on the multiple sources which are present on a single conductor. So if we go into this capacitance now, let's keep with the lump, it's easier to read. 
you can see the number of entries here is 16 because it's a four times four matrix because we have four conductors and every conductor is carrying a source definition. That's important. If we go to the partial RC solver first, in the special, you can see the, here's the same option that we had in the in the e-static solver, that all conductors which do not have a source definition should be treated as grounded. However, in my setup, this is not applying because every conductor I have carries at least one source definition. So this is why in the end I'm getting this basically four times four matrix, uh, 16 entries, and it merges basically the multiple sources that I have on one body in the naming. So if I want to see the capacitance between plus and minus, I have to look at high side one drain because it's just the first naming. It's, it's merging the names uh, according just to the alphabetical order. So high side drain is basically the first source definition on the plus while low side source is the first definition on the minus because they have these four definitions on the same sing, single conductor body. So that's something you have to be aware what you are doing. If you're putting this multiple, uh, multiple sources on the same conductor, you have to then go back and think what, what's the one that I'm looking for. And that's exactly high side one drain and low side one source. That's the one we are looking for. That's the capacitance which we have previously calculated in the setup called e-static floating. And in the e-static floating, if we go here, it was, ah, sorry, not e-static floating, e-static grounded, sorry, that was wrong. So the e-static grounded calculated 7.5 E minus 12, and now the partial RLC solver is 7.38 E minus 12. So you see, it's no longer that exact. It's, it's important to understand. The partial RLC solver has calculated the capacitance with, uh, with a normal material. So there is always a deviation depending how the solver handles materials and so on, but you can see they are close to each other. So 7.38 E minus 12 would be exactly the, the capacitance which we can compare to the E-static ground. And the capacitance between the two conductive bodies and the naming has been chosen according to the really large number of nodes. Now, if we look into the partial capacitance, you see now the partial capacitance is, is no longer a four times four matrix. I have many more entries because it's this number. So we have uh, the number of nodes times the number of nodes that I have defined. Uh, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 nodes. So then now the partial capacitance matrix is 15 times 15. And at this point, you have to ask yourself, is this still human readable? Actually, if we now look into the spice, so this is the spice exported from the full run. It contains all this information. It contains resistors, it contains the uh, um, um, inductors between the wires, and it contains the full capacitance matrix. So of course, our RLC model is human readable, but once your number of nodes is high, it's really difficult to read this simply because the, the system is that complex. You can see all the capacitance, all the partial capacitance has been calculated and now put into this SPICE file. And now, of course, people love to test our software. I know many customers love to test our software. And if the test goes wrong, they say the software is doing something wrong. While every week I have a customer where not the software is wrong, but his testing is wrong. <laughs> And one of the tests would be, now I have the SPICE model. How do I extract the capacitance? So here inside is the partial capacitance. How do I get back to this particular value here? How do I get the 7.3 E minus 12, which is the capacitance between the bodies? That's possible, but you have to be careful. So first of all, if we want to compare things, we have to make sure that we are comparing the same things. And I now created a setup which does the right thing and I would like to explain it to you. First of all, we're saying the others are grounded, right? So what we need to do, we need to ground the, uh, the AC plate. So these are the six nodes which are on the AC conductive body. And this is the node which is on the cooling plate. If you want to do the same setup, we're saying like that the conductors are, are grounded, the two one, the two conductors for which I'm not looking at the capacitance and they need to be grounded. That's exactly what I'm doing. And now I need to say, okay, 
all the four sources which are located on the plus body, they need to be put at the same potential. So I need to connect them together and I need to place a port connecting them and the same on the minus. So low side source, all three nodes which are on the low side source and the minus, they have to be connected all together. So this is now the right setup how to calculate the uh, the capacitance from the spice model, the capacitance and not the partial capacitance. And here I have to be even more careful because remember when I w calculated the capacitance in the full wave model, I took Z or I took Y parameters. In this particular setup, if we look at the Z capacitance calculated between the two ports using Y or Z parameters, they actually differ. And you can see that the Y parameters deliver exactly the same value, 7.38 or bump, which is exactly the same value you read what the solver gave to you, while the Z parameters deliver a different value. And why is this the case? We have to look how our admittance or how our impedance parameters, Z parameters, how they are defined. And you can see the Z12. So basically the, the mutual impedance between the two ports assumes that the current is set to zero. And this is wrong because what we need, if we want to calculate the capacitance, we have to set the voltage to zero because that's how the capacitance is defined. If you have set the current to zero, what, what's the point here? We have four nodes on each, so we, we bundle these four nodes, right? And we have to make sure that these four nodes at the mutual side, basically, that these four nodes are all set to the same voltage, because that's how we calculate the capacitance. If we all set them to a zero current, there will be a voltage difference between the nodes. So you will have a voltage difference on your conductive body. And this is wrong. This is not how the capacitance is defined. And this is the reason why we have to use Y parameters in this case, because this does the right assumption about the voltage. And in this way, we can calculate the full capacitance from the partial capacitance. But be aware, you need to be really exact of what you are doing. If you have first, what makes it complex, you have multiple number of conductors in the computational domain. And then in the partial RLC, you have a multiple number of sources on the same conductor, which makes this setup really complex to understand, but still not unsolvable. If you do the right setup, you can calculate the exactly the values for the capacitance, which are also shown by the solver. So I hope you, you find this very useful. I think it's really not that straightforward, even sometimes if you have a naive view on the capacitance, you will fail here. But everything the solvers are doing is right. You just need to make sure that you are comparing them correctly. So thanks for listening. Don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe and see you for the next video. Bye bye.